from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You know, your run-of-the-mill American evangelical church does not follow the church year. Wherein what starts for us at Advent culminates in a focus upon the last day. If you ever step back in this area behind that door over there, there's a beautiful photograph of the church year. How it starts in Advent and swings all the way around to a focus upon the return of Christ. And we do that year after year after year after year. Because we're Lutherans. And it's important to do something like that. This is a series that lasts all year. It's 52 weeks to cover before we start it all over again. And one could sum up, it's actually quite beautifully displayed back here in this print, one might sum up the first half of the church year as following the life of Christ. It's more of the festivals during that period of time where we focus our attention upon His birth and upon His life and upon His death and His resurrection and His ascension. Well then at Trinity Sunday, everything turns what? Green. Everything is green. And we focus on the teachings of Christ during that period of time. A lot of His parables are our gospel lesson during the Trinity season, as we call it. Everything turns green. Green indicates what? Growth. Growth. And so that's what we're after as we focus upon those things. Yet, again, the American Evangelical Church does not operate like that. Which is fine, I guess if you like missing out on things. Instead, what they've done is they've created their own church year. And their calendar tends to follow actually a pattern of American culture. For example, in many evangelical churches, the focus in January is on stewardship. And why is that? Because everybody's broke. They just spent all their money on Christmas. They ordered tons and tons of Amazon packages and they ain't got any money. They're in debt. And so now the pastor here is seen as an expert financial planner. And he's got all of his spiritual ducks in a row. And his admonition to his people is be like me. Get all your financial ducks in a row. In February, the focus is on relationships. Why? Because it's February. And that only means one thing. Valentine's Day. And now the pastor is a matchmaker. Or a relationship expert. In March, Easter gets an honorable mention, which is noble for a Christian church. But there's March Madness, and it is in full swing. And that gets a lot of attention. The focus at church during that period of time is all about staying in the game and playing through and preserving in the Christian life, or persevering, rather, in the Christian life. I could go on and on throughout the entire year, but I think you get the point. I mention this because our gospel lesson makes an appearance within most of your run-of-the-mill American evangelical churches during their pseudo-church calendar. Every year, at some point, this text is turned to and it is preached, which you think it would be great. That's great. However, you would not believe where they place the emphasis. To them, the gospel lesson that you just heard is all about having and being a good friend. That's what it's all about. Friends like the ones that are depicted in, on bulletin covers. Friends that bring their other friend to Jesus. Be a friend like that. Do whatever it takes to get your friend before Jesus. And the message at the end of that sermon is, be like them. 
Now look, there's a grain of truth in a message like that, but just a smidge. Because we bring our children to the font, we bring them and others to the divine service, we invite our neighbors and our co-workers and we pray for them. Another example, that we think about the work that LWML does for others, but to take this text and emphasize friendship over and above forgiveness of sins, Or to take this text and completely miss what it says of Jesus? Talk about missing the forest for the trees. So let's not be like them. Let's not focus upon what they focus on. Let's get it right. In the Nicene Creed, that which we just confessed together, we publicly asserted our belief that God is the maker of all things, both visible and invisible. In the second article of the Creed, we confess that God came down from heaven, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and made man. We confess precisely what St. Matthew testifies in this text. Namely, that God made the visible and the invisible, and that God became man. These things are true. And with the healing of the paralytic, Jesus commands both, the visible and the invisible. Thus, Jesus is a man, meaning that he is wrapped in human skin. He is enfleshed in human skin. And what courses through his veins is human blood. But he only can do what God can do. First, Jesus addresses the invisible because this man's paralysis, that which was extremely visible, was not his greatest trouble. Though many thought that to be the case. The man's greatest trouble revolved around the sins that were piled up upon his soul. St. Paul actually writes of this and details this sinfulness, affecting us just as, it did the, uh, just as much as it did the paralyzed man. Futility of mind, darkened understanding, alienation from God, ignorance, blindness of heart, conscience dulled, given over to lewdness, working uncleanliness, greediness. Gang, that's an ugly, ugly list and we're guilty of it. Some days we're guilty of all of it. The paralytic man was guilty of sin, as were the men who carried him to Jesus. But the Lord saw their faith. Jesus saw their sin, which was invisible. Their faith was invisible too. He saw their faith. He saw their sin. All invisible to everyone else. Thus, Jesus determined to give the healing that faith most desires, namely the forgiveness of sins. So with a word, he proclaims the paralytic man's sins forgiven. Now, this is something only God can do. His was a divine action, surpassing man's ability, and yet the man, Christ, does it, exercising power over the invisible solely by his word. You know, in our liturgy, specifically divine service setting 3, 4, and 5, we have our help is in the name of the Lord. With the response, who made heaven and earth? The pastor says, I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And the people say, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now think about this. Why would a verse about God making heaven and earth be included in a section having to deal with the confession of sins? Because how did God create heaven and earth? It was by what we call His performative word. Meaning that when He speaks, it happens. It performs. It is a performative word. Folks, we don't have that. Our dog won't even come to us when we call Him by His name. And certainly our cat won't. We have no performative word. 
God does. He says, let there be light, and there is light. He says, let there be faith, because faith cometh by. It's a performative word. And if he can make heaven and earth with solely his performative word, with the power of his word, what can he do with your sins? Wow. By the power of his word, he can cast them so far that they will never be found again, so far that no one possibly can bring them back as far as the Bible says the east is from the west. Now, did this authority for, to forgive sins ascend to heaven with Jesus after his resurrection? Absolutely not. The risen Lord Christ, the King of the universe, left that authority on earth because he wants you to receive it, which you already have this morning. You heard me say, in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. Which means you're forgiven. Literally, the word means you're loosed. The chains have fallen out off. Your sins are now Jesus's, and you can't have them anymore. He dies with them, and he takes them with him to his tomb. Sure, the absolution that you heard, it sounded like a guy from the south, and that's why you understood me. You're my people. But it was Jesus saying that, delivering what only Jesus can deliver and doing what only Jesus can do. He addresses what is invisible to you, but it is visible to you. Him. So that thing that you're ashamed of, forgiven. That regret, forgiven. That thing that you did, forgiven. That thing you should have done that you didn't do, forgiven. Jesus' words of absolution is freedom. It's life. For those of you who are in Bible class, and I know who you were, it's salvific. It's salvation. It's life. And you won't hear the absolution anywhere else other than in Christ's church. Not on the boat. Not on the golf course. Not at St. Mattress. None of those places. This is what Jesus does for this paralyzed man. And gang, it's what He does for you. But here's the hiccup in the Gideon. When Christ absolves you through His called and His ordained pastors, do you see anything happening? Do you hear anything? Other than the words of absolution, is there something that you hear in your soul that, you know, it'd be, wouldn't it be great if it, there was a noise associated with it? It's like, you know! I was trying to think of an analogy, and this is the only one I can come up with, and it's terrible, okay? So just cut it out if you don't like it. It's kind of like when you're working on a plunged, I mean, a stopped up toilet. And you're working, and you're a working, and you're a working, and you're thinking, this thing ain't gonna work, and you're a working, and you're a working, and you're a plunging, and you're a plunging, and all of a sudden, everything lets go, and it's just this whoosh. It's like, wow, I love that sound finally done with this yucky job. It would be great if we would hear some whoosh of our sins when they are forgiven. We don't hear that. Is there any proof that your sins are now cast as far from you as the east is from the west? No. No. All you have is a word. All you have is a promise. Just a promise. And it's the same promise that Jesus gives to the paralytic. Your sins are forgiven. 
Folks, this is how God deals with us. Why? Because here we walk by faith and not by sight and not by sound, wishing sounds when we're forgiven. Which means we live by trusting His promises even, even when it's difficult to do so. When Jesus made this pronouncement to the man that his sins were forgiven, the religious watchdog, the religious watchdogs of the day, they thought that Jesus had crossed the line into blasphemy. That he intruded on divine right, equating himself with the Almighty, because in Jesus saying this, Jesus is claiming to be God. The only God who can deal with the invisible. He's claiming to be the one to whom all flesh must give answer. Claiming to be the one whom before every knee must bow. Claiming to be the one who can open the doors of heaven and who can sentence sinners to hell. That's who he's claiming to be. So to them, this was scandalous. I mean, they had no faith in Jesus. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and thus they couldn't see the blinders were on their eyes. This man is a blasphemer. So in response to their silent accusations, the Lord works another miracle. This time He commands, not the invisible, He's already dealt with the invisible, now He commands the visible. He tells the paralyzed man to what? Rise. And so, instantly, Sensitivity and power and motion returns. Atrophied muscles restore. Strength once again courses through this man's vein and the paralyzed man rises little by little with his eyes fixed on his deliverer and everyone else's eyes fixed on him. No physical therapy. Praise be to God. He gets up. And he stands straight before Jesus. Jesus who commands both the invisible as well as the visible. Jesus who is the God that came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. Jesus who grants the forgiveness of sins to all who believe in Him. So Jesus attaches a visible, external sign to an invisible miracle. If you didn't get that one sentence, you didn't even get the sermon. Jesus attaches a visible, external sign to an invisible miracle. The physical healing of paralysis, the visible it proved that the forgiveness of sins, the invisible, had taken place. And thus the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins and wants to give, you, give that to you just as freely, just as willingly, just as quickly as He gave it to the man that was placed before Him. Friends, you're going to tell me that this text has to do with making and keeping good friends? Are you insane? Beloved, your greatest need is not having or being a good friend. It's forgiveness. And to obtain this forgiveness, you don't have to cut a hole in the roof to get to Jesus. He is accessible to each one of you in the waters of holy baptism, in the word of absolution, in the preaching of His word, and in His holy supper where He gives you His body and blood. And get that, get that! There He attaches a visible sign to an invisible miracle. Taste and see the Lord is good. He attaches a visible, external sign, bread and wine, water and word, so that you know that you receive Christ. And in particular, to the eating and drinking, your sins are forgiven.
And only in His church does He give these things to you. Only in His church does He deal with your soul, which is invisible. But gratefully and in conclusion, it does not end there, does it? One day He'll deal with your body too. He will deal with the visible just as He promised that He would. He will call it forth from the grave and everyone will see you will stand just as strong, even stronger, than this previously paralytic man. And this is why we confess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Whose body? My body. This body. That's why we make the sign of the cross over this body. Resurrection of the body. Not Jesus' body. He's already resurrected. Your body. I believe in the resurrection of my body. This body. And the life everlasting. So be of good cheer, dear Christian. Your sins are forgiven. The Lord that commands the visible as well as the invisible, He has seen your faith and He grants you the healing that avails to all eternity. In the holy name of Jesus, amen.